Thank you very much, uh, Gianni, and it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here and joining all of you for this discussion. It's an incredibly important one at the moment. Um, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm co-chair of the uh, steering committee of the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition. So what I want to speak to a little bit today is really how carbon pricing and some related policies can help us to build back better, including to roll out much more quickly um, uh, solar development uh, globally for all the benefits it brings in terms of low cost and accessible energy, um, in terms of a clean environment and avoiding some of the major risks from climate change uh, and air pollution that we see already hitting uh, communities and people around the world. So next slide, please. Just next slide, please. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Just very briefly on the Carbon Pricing uh, Leadership Coalition. It's really a group of leaders from government, business and civil society and academia that come together to support carbon pricing, share experiences, both the good and the bad, and learn how to spread and increase the use of carbon pricing globally. Um, it's uh, what we've done through the Leadership Coalition has helped to build a strong evidence base of lessons learned, uh, some of the challenges and the other experiences to inspire and inform action um, and advocate for the principle of uh, pricing carbon uh, building on experience we see around the world. So there's a link there. There's a wealth of materials there from the public sector, the private sector, from investors on how we can implement carbon pricing and do it successfully in a way which benefits people um, uh, that uh, in particular poor and uh, low income and uh, um, other communities, uh, but also uh, in a way which actually achieves the economic and the environmental goals that we have. Next slide, please. Thank you. And I will say just briefly, I on, on the CPLC, I'm going to have to leave fairly promptly at 10 o'clock this, uh, this event because there's a high level event of the CPLC happening. Um, and you can follow that if you're interested on World Bank Live, where leaders will be discussing further the role of carbon pricing in the economic recovery. But let me say a few words about what we've seen in terms of the economic recovery and what we need to do. There was a, a, a fantastic uh, paper just recently released by Cameron Hepburn, Joe Stieglitz, uh, Nick Stern, and others, which really surveyed uh, 231 central bank officials, finance ministry officials, and others, and, and said, you know, what are the elements that governments can use in terms of economic recovery, which will both have strong economic multiplier effects, right? Benefits for the economy, benefits for jobs, and also benefit uh, the climate. And they came with a list of five. And I wanted to highlight these five here because two of these relate very much to solar energy development and deployment. So first, um, uh, first uh, clean physical infrastructure investment. So that's very much uh, uh, aligned with uh, solar deployment. And they highlight there a number of different ways that governments can actually help push us forward, including de-risking private investment, um, uh, such as through um, uh, competitive auctions for solar, uh, uh, incentivizing um, or investing directly in support for uh, transmission and distribution uh, for energy, um, uh, using uh, development fi finance uh, institutions, such as the multilateral development banks, to support uh, the, the rollout of solar, and fast-tracking permits so that we can ensure that there are projects that are shovel-ready uh, to go now for the investments that we're seeing coming forward uh, for economic recovery. So that first one, clean uh, physical infrastructure investment is obviously one of the key ones and it delivers both economic benefits, um, jobs, and also uh, uh, um, climate benefits. A second one is building efficiency, not a surprise probably for many on this call. Uh, again, a lot of benefits from that. Third, investment in education and training. Um, including to sort of uh, ensure a just transition for workers who've been uh, laid off or who have lost income. Um, fourth, natural capital investment uh, to, to build ecosystem resilience and regeneration. And fifth, um, investing in clean research and development spending, which will long term help to uh, develop the future that we need. Next slide. Thanks very much. And this just, uh, this sort of, it shows graphically one of the points that you made, uh, Gianni, at the opening remarks. Thank you very much. I mean, one of the things we have seen, which we should 
uh, should be a lesson that we take into uh, economic recovery from this crisis is just that investments in renewable energy and energy efficiency tend to generate much more jobs than the same level of investments in fossil fuels. So for example, in the US, we know that they generate about double the amount of jobs as the same investments as you would have in uh, fossil fuels. Um, so significantly better. This graphic shows, um, shows the results across a number of countries, primarily the OECD developed economies. But again, you can see that in terms of both the direct jobs and the induced jobs, you've got uh, strong benefits from investing in solar PV. Um, that's particularly high in terms of induced jobs, but also the direct jobs and energy efficiency um, and wind. So much better uh, solutions than investing in coal or gas if your intention, as for many countries it is right now, is really to generate jobs and income to boost our way out of this economic uh, um, uh, challenge, challenging period. Next slide. Um, thanks very much. So in this context, um, uh, in terms of carbon pricing, there's a couple of things that I did want to mention here. One, um, carbon pricing can help with a sort of risk assessment of investment portfolios so that investors are much more aware of the risks associated with their different investments, where high carbon uh, investments can actually lead to, uh, to financial risks. Um, and as they start to do that, that is something which will start to favor renewable options over fossil fuels, providing an incentive for investors to shift there. We're already seeing in terms of the investment community incredible shifts away from coal very rapidly, um, from private investors, from multilateral development banks, um, uh, from sovereign wealth funds. They've been moving away from investments in coal, increasingly moving away from oil and gas. But doing risk and uh, assessments will actually help to uh, move this even more rapidly. Um, second, a, an important aspect is the revenues that are generated through carbon pricing instruments which can be really um, instrumental as we look to make major infrastructure investments now. Um, we've seen uh, governments around the world have committed to at least $9 trillion in investments in terms of uh, COVID-19 response and then economic recovery. It's likely to be even more. So any revenues that we can generate through instruments like carbon pricing or through reform of fossil fuel subsidies will both help to um, address uh, the fiscal gap that we're going to have, but also create the right incentives to actually move more rapidly towards a low carbon uh, economy and expand the use of renewable energy. Um, and then third, uh, carbon pricing and other policies can really help to highlight and support investment in areas that actually deliver these better results, as we said, both in economic terms and climate metrics and actually social metrics as well. Um, at the moment, we have a large number of people who are dying prematurely each year from air pollution, um, shifting away from fossil fuel use, which makes up the majority of uh, the origins of that air pollution, is one way to actually help address that um, global uh, health crisis uh, in terms of air pollution. Next slide. So in terms of uh, making sure that the investments in infrastructure we put in place as part of the economic recovery really have lasting effects, we need to make sure that we've got the right policies there to accompany these uh, to ensure that. So one um, that we would call for is disclosure of climate related financial risks. This is something that the task force on the climate related uh, uh, financial risks have, have uh, put forward some recommendations, a number of companies and Investors are now using those, that's the TCFD, but let's ramp those up even more rapidly at this time to make sure we're not making risky investments. This is especially important as uh, countries around the world look at uh, potential bailouts as part of the economic recovery. Wherever these are done in terms of industry bailouts, particularly high carbon industries, there should be a requirement to disclose the financial risks um, uh, related to climate impacts there. Um, second, fossil fuel subsidy reform. Uh, the latest data from OECD and IEA suggests that uh, fossil fuel subsidies, either to production or consumption, uh, directly or through tax breaks, amounted to $478 billion in 2019. It's an enormous amount. If we we're able to actually get rid of those inefficient and often ineffective subsidies, um, that's a lot that governments could deploy towards other purposes. 
And then finally, of course, as I mentioned, uh, carbon pricing, which has a great potential to raise revenues. Um, in 2019, uh, the carbon pricing initiatives we had globally raised $45 billion in revenues. There's potential for a lot more as we further expand those. And if we go to the next slide, this is my final one, but just to sort of highlight what we're already seeing in terms of carbon pricing globally. Um, at the moment, we have 79 countries or subnational states or provinces that are applying carbon pricing globally or about to start. They have it planned for the next uh, year or two years. Overall, this covers about 22% of global greenhouse gas emissions. I hope you're able to see the map here. It's a little bit uh, difficult to see on the screen, but um, if you look up World Bank uh, carbon pricing, um, uh, you will find this map uh, online as well, and you can go into depth on each of the countries. So carbon pricing has been expanding uh, recently uh, quite significantly. Um, as I said, now 79 national or subnational uh, carbon pricing schemes in place. Um, we have seen last year, for example, uh, there's carbon pricing put in place in South Africa, in Argentina, in Singapore. As we look to build back better from the COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic, I think this is one of the instruments government should be looking at in terms of raising revenues and setting the right incentives in place to get a shift more rapidly to a low carbon economy and away from our polluting, inefficient fossil fuel based economy now. Um, so let me stop there. Happy to uh, engage in the questions and answers later. Thank you very much, Jeremy.